Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to our lecture this evening, Chasing Threads, We're Next for the Galloway Horde. It's wonderful to welcome you to Kirkubri Galleries to hear from Dr. Adrian Maldonado as he summarises the main findings of this seminar series, addresses some reoccurring audience questions, and discusses the gaps in our knowledge which still remain about the Galloway Horde. My name is Shona Burns, I'm the facilitator this evening, and I'm an arts officer here at Kirkubri Galleries. A few pieces of housekeeping before I introduce our speaker this evening. Hopefully there aren't any, but should you have any technical questions, please post them in the Q&A and we'll do our best to help. This event is being recorded and will be made available on our YouTube page in the coming weeks. Our previous lectures are already there and you can find links to these on our website and Facebook page. Dr. Adrian Maldonado is the Galloway Hoard Researcher at the National Museums of Scotland. His interests include early medieval Scotland, the Viking Age, early Christianity, the archaeology of death and burial, and medievalism in pop culture. He's also the author of Crucible of Nations from 2021. We're delighted to have Adrian join us today for our final lecture in this lecture series. And just to remind everyone, if you have any questions as the lecture goes on, please post them in the Q&A function. And I'll pass it over to Adrian. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you, Shona, for that introduction. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming out tonight. And for those of you viewing uh, online, uh, welcome. Well, I hope everybody can see that. Uh, so uh, my job today is kind of an impossible one. Uh, we're talking about what we know so far, but more about what we still don't know uh, uh, about the Galloway Horde. The kind of threads that we're still chasing, whether they are literal threads of textile, like the ones you see here, or more conceptual ideas, themes, and uh, 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 subject areas, new questions that the Galloway Horde raises about other hordes, and just about the Viking Age in Scotland and more widely. Uh, this, for me, this is the most, probably the most exciting uh, uh, part of the whole uh, research, the sort of scoping out of future work and what else needs done. So uh, what I'm going to do today is kind of catch you up on what we've managed so far, uh, just to give you a better sense of how much is still left to do. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so I won't go through the full history of the Galloway Horde. I just want to place us today on the much longer timeline of the Galloway Horde. And for more detail on any of these stages, you can go back to the brilliant series of online seminars uh, uh, that parts of the team have been able to record uh, this year. So uh, there you see Derek McLennan, uh, uh, um, one of the team who discovered the Galloway Horde in 2014 on the day, uh, and Andy Nicholson, county archaeologist in the process of excavation uh, as part of the call out um, that emerged when it was first reported. Uh, the stage that followed after that was sort of investigating the site to a certain extent, and then crucially the stabilization and identification of all of the objects within the Horde, which was taken out by the, uh, the conservation team at AOC Archaeology. Uh, there's uh, are a lot of the initial photographs uh, that we still use in presentations like the one that you see here. Uh, in 2017, uh, having been uh, sort of uh, uh, cataloged and conserved or at least stabilized, uh, it was then put up into the treasure trove process and it was allocated to the NMS in 2017, at which point uh, the fundraising campaign uh, took place over about six months in order to raise uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the money to uh, acquire it. Uh, uh, which we were able to do thanks to uh, 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 many, many donors uh, uh, and charitable uh, offerings. Um, so at that point, uh, uh, the, the money raised was uh, able to uh, we were able to appoint a lead conservator, that's Mary Davis, who you heard a few lectures ago, uh, a master conservator who has expertise in lots of different materials, which was exactly what we needed uh, for the Galloway Horde. I strongly recommend you go back and watch that one if you haven't uh, already. Uh, really, the exhibition as it, as it stands in, in 2021 and the touring exhibition, which is on the road still today, um, that is really the handiwork 
of uh, uh, of the conservation scientist primarily, Mary Davis, who's uh, sort of put this together. And so the Galloway Horde exhibition, as it is now, is really the, the current state of play with almost all of the objects, but a critical number of fragile objects still held back because they are continuing to undergo conservation and new analysis. And that takes us to where we are today. Uh, from 2021 till 2024, uh, we've entered a new stage of the project while the Horde is still on tour and still not on permanent display anywhere. We are able to still continue this analysis and research. And this is in part now funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and a project entitled Unwrapping the Galloway Horde, which I'll tell you a little bit more about momentarily. But I just wanted to pause there having given you this sort of sweep of time at the beginning of the timeline of where we are, just to kind of uh, uh, tell you how many different ways there are to find out more about the Horde, or at least what we know up until now. The main thing to do is simply see it in the gallery. And uh, just a reminder for those who, uh, who still haven't seen it in Kirkubri, it's there until the 10th of July. But the other advantage, even if you saw it in Edinburgh, to seeing it at Kirkubri is that there is a research update, a little interactive display, which takes things forward uh, a, a year on into the research. And in addition, the Aberdeen leg of the tour will have a new research update that we've developed specifically for that one, uh, uh, which will have even more updates uh, on the kind of textile research that we've been able to do. So there's elements of the exhibition that are different every time. So I do recommend uh, uh, repeat visits, of course. Uh, you can also uh, buy this book, uh, uh, the sort of statement of where we were in 2021 with the research by Martin Goldberg and Mary Davis, the conservator. Uh, and then finally, stay tuned to all of our social media channels, but there's lots of much deeper uh, dives available already on the Galloway Horde landing page of the NMS. Uh, there's other resources like learning resources for schools and 3D models. Uh, and so there's a lot more to explore. Where we are now. This is uh, where the bulk of the activity uh, now lies. The Unwrapping the Galloway Horde project is focused uh, 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 and led uh, in a partnership between us and the University of Glasgow uh, under the co-investigator um, Susanna Harris uh, of the University of Glasgow. She's a textile specialist, but she also uh, uh, does a lot of research on uh, hoarding and the sort of preservation uh, of organic materials in the past. And so this phase of the project is, is not just about the scientific analysis of the textiles, that's a big part of it, but also on why this was put together. What does it mean that these objects were hoarded? And that's some of the threads that I want to chase with you today just to give you a sense of the kind of questions that we haven't answered yet. And in some cases, questions that are only beginning to be asked. So that's where we are now. Oh, and also just as a reminder, for those of you watching on YouTube, you know very well that there is a recorded series of lectures before this one, uh, beginning with the big overview by Martin Goldberg, uh, following on with the textiles, the conservation, the runic inscriptions, and the replication, which is something that we uh, hope to continue to explore over the coming years, okay? Um, there's a YouTube playlist that I'll share on social media after this, which will have all of those videos together. It's a, uh, an incredible, uh, a really useful resource, I think, just to have this available there and all free for you to watch, okay? So that's us caught up. I will not take you through, again, the entire structure of the Horde uh, bit by bit. It'll be, it would be at this point a little bit like watching another Batman reboot in which you see his childhood and what happens to his parents over and over again. We won't do that here today. I just direct you to the uh, previous videos in this series if you want to find out more detail. But we always generally begin with an image like this, the wider structure of the Horde. But I don't want to, again, go from top to bottom. I want to start with the one bit in the middle that I think kind of unlocks for me what, where I'm at in terms of why the Galloway Horde was deposited the way that it was. This is the lower deposit 
Uh, and this consists of the bulk of the silver and other objects in the hoard. Uh, this was a mobile phone photograph of the discovery as it was happening, as it was sort of being excavated. Um, and so you can see the sort of uh, three lower elements of that hoard packed very closely together into that gravel as it emerged. Um, these three lower elements are all the subject of different strands of this research, but I want to focus on that arm ring cluster in particular. Not only is this an incredible object, uh, it, 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 it's incredibly beautiful and it features in a lot of these sort of uh, uh, glamour shots that we use to sort of uh, 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 to dot the exhibition and to advertise this hoard, of course. But there's a lot to say about just this. In, in Martin and Mary's book, you know, they pose the question, of what this cluster means and 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 what they what they say about it you know they ask the question does this maybe represent a contract and why would that be we have lots of arm rings and and, and i'll show you a couple of images of arm rings very similar to these uh, that have been found in clusters in nests in groups uh similar to this but this one uh is more so than the ones that we found in the past there are four different ribbon arm rings. And these are the largest and heaviest of the silver stamped arm rings uh, found in these Viking Age hordes. These are the, uh, the wealthiest ones, if you like, the ones that represent uh, the greatest amount of silver. They're also the most elaborate in terms of the decoration. These snake heads that you see here show that one of the arm rings, the central two uh, that you see there, are in fact a single arm ring made out of two joined together, bound up uh, by what looks like, what's made to look like the tongues of these serpents. It's a really rare motif. You do find it on sort of items of jewelry and it has a long pedigree and it's not necessarily in the Scandinavian world that you find this kind of motif. Although the image of beasts coming together, staring at each other uh, or, or even sort of, uh, 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 sort of biting one another, that certainly carries on through the Viking age, but uh, is not specific to Scandinavia. What's interesting about this is that these four arm rings have been joined together by a fifth one. And that seems to be the sort of coming together of four groups or four individuals uh, into this sort of uh, um, agreement of some sort. And to find that at the center of this horde, I think is really evocative. If we, if we sort of follow that thread and we see this horde as you know, a, a group of people coming together rather than the possessions of one person or one warlord, uh, uh, I, I think it sort of opens up new ways of looking at it. I think uh, we can sort of see the horde as many different things that have come together. But I, I, I don't want to leave you with a sense that it is lots of different things randomly smashed together. I, I, I want to kind of show that there is more rhyme and reason uh, than that to the horde deposit. As I mentioned, there are other Viking Age silver hordes that have these nested items. Uh, and indeed, the one from Silverdale, uh, the outer arm ring is very similar to this double arm ring here in that it has two very similar serpent heads looking at each other across the uh, coiled terminals. Uh, uh, and, and you can find more images of the Silverdale hoard already uh, online. Um, it, dates to the early part of the 10th century, probably around the same time as the Galloway Horde. But within that horde and within other hordes of this kind of time period, there are clusters and parcels. And in this one from Silverdale, there is this sense as well of groups of arm rings, as if it was not just piles of silver, but that different groupings within that silver were placed together. In this case, they were nested. In our case, they were kind of tied together. Uh, and in this one other group from Silverdale that you see at the center, again, there are these rings which are almost kind of tied together. There is a sense that these hordes are not just sort of treasure chests, that they have elements to them, that there were parts, that there were almost fragments 
of a sentence or verses in a poem. You know, I don't want to get uh, uh, too romantic about it, but that there is a structure to them and that there is sort of rhyme and reason behind them. The problem with most Viking Age hordes is that they were found long ago or they were found in sort of uh, uh, unrecorded circumstances and things were kind of pulled out of the ground uh, 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 in a way that wasn't recorded very well. Uh, with the Galloway Horde, because uh, Andy Nicholson was able to come out and excavate on the day of discovery, uh, we have a very clear picture of how everything was structured. And because of the conservation science that has gone on behind it, we've been able to fill in the gaps even from that, uh, the day of discovery, okay? Uh, uh, so it affords us a lot of opportunities to ask new things about how Viking Age Hordes were put together. Another thing I want to say is that Galloway Horde is very much an outlier within Scotland. Uh, the stamped ribbon arm rings uh, and these broadband arm rings that make up most of the silver are actually quite rare in Scotland, however common they are in the Irish Sea Zone and in Northwest England, where the largest uh, hordes of this type are found. Uh, in Yorkshire and uh, Cumbria and Lancashire, there are very large hordes of around this time. And now Galloway Horde kind of falls into this wider Northern Irish Sea, Solway Firth nexus of uh, silver trade. Okay, so Galloway, uh, now really neatly falls under this sort of wider umbrella of Viking Age activity around the year 900 involving the trade in silver. But there are other items that were found in and around Galloway, Dumfrieshire, Southwest Scotland, and indeed uh, just across the border uh, in Northern England, which show that silver was already kind of swimming around in this area. And it's not just sort of uh, a one-off, or at least not as much of a one-off as it seems. And case in point is uh, um, just one of these uh, stamped gold finger rings. And this is an incredibly uh, rare type of Viking Age object. Usually the gold rings are very simple and it's the silver that's decorated. Um, and it's, it's probably because the gold was very quickly melted down and reused into other objects where the silver was able to be cut up and traded as silver. Uh, you rarely find these complete objects in gold. And we have so much gold uh, that in, in the Galloway Horde that it is actually uh, uh, the most uh, gold from any Viking Age Horde uh, in, in, in Scotland, I believe in Britain as well. Uh, but this stray find from a long, a long time ago uh, from Tundergarth uh, shows you that there were these things uh, um, that we still find as, as, as stray finds, you know? So there was more than just this hoard. There was more of this stuff circulating. It just goes to show that Galloway and Dumfrieshire were a, a sort of central areas, not peripheral uh, to the wider sort of trade zone. So there's another point to make there. Uh, the Galloway hoard is not normal by any means, but it fits into a pattern uh, by which we can situate Southwest Scotland into that wider Irish sea world. Now, I started with that contract, as it were, the, 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 the arm ring cluster. Um, and one of the things that Martin's research in particular has already been able to bring out, you could read more about this in the Galloway Horde book, is that there is a structure to the piles and piles of silver beyond that arm ring cluster. There are these four inscribed arm rings, which uh, you can find out more about in David Parsons' lecture in this series. Um, but the fact that there's four of these is also really evocative, uh, uh, given the sort of cluster of four arm rings. What Martin's able has been able to find out so far is that each of these arm rings has got a, a different kind of fold. One of them is perfectly flat. One of them is bent in a sort of hook shape. One is just bent uh, at the very ends and one is bent uh, like a third of the way down. So there's four different kinds of bends to this silver uh, or, or, or flat is, is, is the other, the fourth, uh, uh, the fourth kind. And if you add up all the ones that are flat and add up all the ones that are, have the folded at the ends, they add up to coherent parcels according to the weight system of that time. So it's almost as if each of the inscribed uh, arm rings belongs to uh, a fourth of the parcel, uh, a fourth parcel uh, that made up the silver hoard. And the other interesting thing about it is that it is not divided between the upper and lower deposit. In 
previous work, we've called the upper deposit the decoy layer, as if it's completely separate from everything that comes below. But Martin's research into the uh, groupings of that silver shows very clearly that there are elements of the upper hoard which tie into elements of that lower deposit of silver. That is to say, the four parcels are divided between upper and lower. Okay, so they are, they go together, even if they ended up being buried separately. So it was amassed together, and then only then sort of made uh, broken up into sort of an upper and lower deposit. There is more to be said about the structuring of this hoard and how it all came together. It's something that we can only really do with the Galloway hoard. Another thing we tend to do is talk about the outer deposit of silver and the interior deposit of the, the objects in that lidded vessel as kind of separate hordes. But another thing that's become very clear is that while they are very di strikingly different, there are things which tie the interior and exterior hordes together. And they, they include things like the gold ingots, one in the outer parcel and one in the interior. There are two different qualities of gold. They are made in different ways. They might belong to different time periods. Uh, but uh, it, it's one of the things that kind of brings the economic part of the hoard, which is the outside, the silver uh, arm rings and the cut up silver, the bullion, uh, and the interior, which is mostly complete objects. These two objects kind of bring the inside and the outside together. This is just to say that there is um, some of the uh, some of the questions that we've gotten so far are, are are things along the lines of: Is it possible that the stuff in the silver uh, vessel uh, is an older deposit which was added to later? I think there's a lot of reason to believe now that it all was deposited together uh, and that it was all sort of uh, uh, hoarded at the same time, even if there's uh, much, much older elements to the hoard. So that's the kind of thing I want to explore. Uh, uh, and again, just because we sort of display it in this exploded diagram, and we usually go from chunk to chunk, I think there are stories and narratives that bring it all together. Okay. Um, uh, the bulk of the research, though, uh, at this point, and certainly from this stage of the project onwards, focuses on uh, the organic and inorganic materials which are found in and around that lidded vessel. So a lot of the work from here on out will uh, be by necessity focused on the materials in that vessel. So I do want to kind of dive into that for, uh, for most of the rest of the lecture, but then I'll come back at the end to the sort of hack silver and the silver economy part of it. So the big advance, something that's just happened very recently, uh, is that the textiles uh, wrapping the silver lidded vessel have only just been removed from that silver vessel by our conservator, Mary Davis. It is something that we have uh, waited this long to do because it is the most fragile and it is also the part of the, uh, 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 the part of those textiles that will probably have in terms of the amount of surviving material, the most information, the most uh, 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 information that we can get out of these. There are at least two, if not three layers of textile that are still visible. And that's even before um, the textile uh, researchers begin to look at it under the microscope a little bit more. So that's only just happened. The lidded vessel that, that I posed with at the opening and that it's on display is a very well done uh, 3D replica, which you heard um, uh, the maker Steve Day talk about in the previous lecture, okay? Uh, but in the coming months, the silver lidded vessel is now exposed for the first time. Those textiles are gonna undergo new analysis for the first time and that silver lidded vessel will be conserved and we'll actually be able to see it uh, ourselves for the very first time. So that's something that's coming down the pike uh, uh, in the next year or two. Okay, but let's dive into that vessel a little bit more. So you've seen this diagram, this is in the exhibition. It's a sort of uh, a schematic uh, drawing of all of the objects at their actual size, just to show how much is packed into that vessel. But again, like the piles of silver on the outside of this vessel, there is very clear structure to how it was placed. It's not just everything piled up, Everything is very neatly uh, 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 packed and stacked. And it is not just because that's a good way to 
pack your luggage, it, there seems to be sort of uh, 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 different sort of hands and different groups of objects that go together within that vessel. Again, showing that there might be more than just a single person involved in putting this together, that there are more groups, there are more stakeholders uh, in the modern lingo, okay? So this is one of these AOC lab conservation images that we are so grateful to have uh, of the image uh, of the lidded vessel as it was first opened uh, uh, by the conservators there. And what you can see in the in the sort of uh, 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 the CT scan image on the lower left there is that there is an upper hoard within this silver vessel, and then there's the lower parcels uh, that that go belong there, uh, that go under it, and they do seem to be of two different kinds of characters. But the thing that brings them all together is that it seems like almost every object, if not every object, inside this uh, lidded vessel was itself wrapped like the vessel itself. So the textiles are allowing us to kind of see bundles or hordes within hordes almost, uh, certainly different groupings. And you can see these beads and these charms and amulets that you can see after their conservation on the top left. When they were first in there, you can see the traces, the imprints, of, uh, of textile, and in some cases, the actual textile that was placed over them. And you can see as well, in between some of these lengths of braid, lengths of cord, which may have been threaded through these objects as well. Uh, and you can see it sort of clinging on there. They're incredible survivals, uh, but the, uh, the conservation is going to allow us to kind of draw an exploded diagram of just what was sort of placed in first and what followed. And so we can really build up in three dimensions how this hoard was put together in a way that I think will be visually striking. Below that upper layer, under the dashed line that you can see on the left in the CT scan, you have the uh, the bossed penannular brooch, that hoop uh, with the sort of circular terminals, forming a kind of floor, a kind of base, separating the, uh, the beads and amulets above and the items below. And below that brooch, below that line, you can see that there's actually two different parts. There's the textile wrapped uh, bundles on one side and the Trujillo style, mainly silver, as opposed to the mainly gold and textile objects on the other side. So there's, again, groupings within groupings. And even within those, there are subgroups, okay? To, to go on the bundle side, these are the things that are, uh, are, are exciting the team now. All of the objects from these bundles have now been removed. Uh, in a previous lecture, you saw, uh, you saw Martin uh, uh, go deep into the rock crystal vessel with that incredible inscription to a bishop called Higwald that you can see when it was still in his wrappings, in its wrappings there on the left. Now, what's interesting there is that there were multiple wrappings as well. There is leather, a very soft leather, almost like a suede, it was described to me, that is forming the outside. And there is a sort of silk lining on the inside. And there's probably more uh, organic material to be teased out from that uh, as well. And this bundle uh, underneath that one, on the left there, uh, um, uh, uh, this one is one that's only recently been emptied out. And I'll show you a little bit of the structure of that one here. Now, there is, uh, there is a, a great we um, update, an interactive update that we've added to the Aberdeen leg of the tour, where you can actually see the new post-conservation images of this stuff now that it's been taken out, okay? And there's a lot more detail on these things, which we could only show you to this extent in the current exhibition as it was designed uh, in 2021, uh, before we had this information. What we had at this point was CT scans and x-rays, which showed us that the bright white objects that you see here are three different objects made out of gold. There's other things in there. There's like this little circlet that you can see on the right, and there's a little zigzag pattern. That zigzag pattern is gold that has been embroidered onto silk cords. And you can see already in this, uh, uh, in this scan that the bulk of this bundle is made out of a coil 
of that silk cord. So there's a lot of silk has gone into making this braid, this cord that runs through these objects and holds it together. It's the real conspicuous use of a lot of silk uh, in something that is sort of load bearing in a way, you know, this sort of cord that is holding things together or holding things up. Uh, but they're using fine uh, materials, rare objects and expensive things like silk and gold uh, to make that. It means that whatever these objects are, more on that to come, uh, is something really special and certainly something that we've not seen uh, this way before. The other thing that the textile analysis and the close conservation by Mary Davis is allowing us to show is that things that have fallen out of some of these bundles, like the pendant that you see on the right there, you can see it has a really loose, open weave textile still attached to it. That textile is very indicative of the textile in that gold and silk bundle that I just showed you see, uh, an x-ray of. And it's possible, we think, that um, this object on your right possibly was part of that bundle and has just kind of fallen out as the textiles have sort of, uh, 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 have sort of given way over the years. Uh, okay, and, and there's, a, there's a hint of a, a braid of that cord, that silken cord, which was threaded through this pendant, which appears to be, to be confirmed, appears to be the same thread that is running in that silk cord bundle. So once all of that, uh, once all of those objects are out, uh, you can see them a lot more clearly, but the gold objects have been removed and there's image of of them, uh, I think there's a there's a teaser of uh, of what those objects look like in Mary Davis's lecture. I think she holds them up at a uh, for a moment there, but you can see the best clearest image of of them in the update that we've added to the Aberdeen leg of the tour. Okay, and that uh, that structure of that hoard, the sort of gold and silk objects on the one side and the silver and the yellow objects on the other, holds up uh, all, all the way down to the very bottom. Uh, and then there's objects that are kind of in between, like these incredibly evocative uh, dirt balls, which also have gold, uh, flecks of gold and bone, might, it, might even be relics uh, uh, gathered from the tomb of a saint maybe. Uh, they're sort of in between these two parcels. And you can see in there as well at the bottom of the hoard, all these bits of braid, cord, and textile. This is stuff that's kind of trickled down as the, uh, uh, as the sort of uh, the organic material decomposed uh, slowly over the years. But the textile researchers using uh, uh, the full array of materials available to us and our partners in the British Museum Scientific Labs are going to be able to hopefully identify each of these objects and place them in with specific textiles. So there's a certain number of textiles that have already been identified and a certain number of cords and braids that have already been identified. And then the rest of the, the work is to kind of piece these uh, uh, small fragments together and say exactly how many objects we really were originally looking at. So all that's to come. Okay, um, there's a lot more announcements. There's a lot more images even still uh, of the hoard still to come. Uh, there uh, And there's still another two years just of the AHRC project, but the research and the thinking on this hoard won't stop with just that one bit of work. Uh, this is going to continue on and on. So we're just kind of exploring where this could go. We're sort of at the launch pad stage of the much wider generation long uh, uh, way of thinking about this hoard, okay? So we can, we can sort of take the research in some directions, but the rest of it is really kind of up to up to future researchers, you know, uh, um, to see where we can go. So what I wanna do for the remainder of the time that I have is just chase some of these threads. Talk about things that we don't really know yet. Talk about some ideas that I personally have about this uh, in my conversations with various members of the team, things that I'm interested in. But this is not by any means all the questions that could still be asked. I just wanted to sort of throw some stories at you. Just see what sticks, see what resonates, and uh, see what stories it evokes for you. One of the things that, uh, that has become very clear already is that the Galloway Horde is no longer a Viking Horde, it's a Viking Age Horde. What that means is that it has elements of the Viking Age silver economy. 
It's incontrovertible. The kinds of silver arm rings that are being used um, in the uh, piles and piles of silver that we have in the Galloway Horde are being made in uh, Viking encampments, urban centers like Dublin. Uh, they are very much part of that Viking Age economy. Uh, but the names inscribed on them are in Old English. They're Old English names. And in a runic script that is not the Scandinavian one, but the Anglo-Saxon one. And in fact, I, I always like to say there's actually only one really Viking in the sense of Scandinavian uh, object in this horde, and it's this single arm ring. It's a, uh, it's a very simple kind. It's probably early in the series before the series of stamped arm rings really takes hold. And it's probably made in Norway, but it's such a simple type that it could have been made in Denmark or in the Baltic. Okay, uh, It's a simple kind of arm ring that's been studied by John Sheehan. And this is the only one that could plausibly have been made in Scandinavia. The rest of them were made somewhere in the Irish Sea Zone, you know, uh, uh, or, or, or even in, in, in Northern England or in Ireland, okay? Um, so there's less and less the more that you look about it that is Viking uh, and more and more that is sort of Viking age. And in fact, I think the story that's really emerged out of all of this is that um, this is a story of a period in Scotland's history that we frankly don't talk about very much and we don't really uh, sort of teach about very well, I would argue. And it's the fact that the Kingdom of Northumbria which is an Anglo-Saxon kingdom, it's an English-speaking kingdom, uh, had a lot of its land and territory uh, in what is now Scotland, certainly north of Hadrian's Wall. The, 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 the sort of, um, you know, we have the stereotype of Hadrian's Wall being the sort of marker between England and Scotland, but a core of that Northumbrian kingdom is based on the hill fort of Bambra and the monastery of Lindisfarne and all of that area uh, the Tweed Valley, all of this area is north of that sort of old Roman border, you know, Northumbria as a kingdom is something that is uh, one of the most powerful kingdoms uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, but it is not Anglo-Saxon England itself. It is one of many kingdoms. And by the time we have this concept of England, it is forming and coalescing around the kingdom of Wessex in the southwest. Okay, And Northumbria uh, is reduced by the Dane law and by the emerging kingdom of Alaba from the 10th century and onwards. Uh, but it remains its own core entity. And south, the south of Scotland remains firmly in that Northumbrian realm, which is kind of fought over between Alba and the emerging kingdom of England. Northumbria remains its own place. It's got its own history. It's been called Middle Britain, you know, this sort of area in between uh, 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 the big river firths that sort of denote northern uh, England and southern Scotland. This part of the world has its own distinct history. And there's a lot of really good history that's been being written about it. But the archaeology of that period of this, this sort of distinct part of the Anglo-Saxon, the English-speaking world, is very much lesser known. And one of the things I found in writing my own book about the Viking Age, or at least the 9th to the 12th centuries, it's called Crucible of Nations. It's in uh, gift shops near you. Um, one thing that I, uh, uh, that I sort of found when I was doing the research on what is Viking about Viking Age, about the material culture in the museum of the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries, is just how Northern English, I suppose, Anglo-Saxon, Northumbrian. Uh, a lot of that material is. Um, and it goes all the way up to Orkney and Shetland. I'll just show you two items which I sort of focused on in my work uh, for that book. There's two true, uh, there's this true Hiddle style drinking horn that made it all the way to the seat of Pictish power uh, in the kingdom of Fertru at Berghead. Uh, there's a horde not far away and probably not far away in time either. It's called the Croy Horde, a kind of little known horde. And in the process of researching the book, I discovered a runic inscription on one of the objects in that horde. And to my surprise, to everyone's surprise, it ended up being yet another uh, Anglo-Saxon runic inscription. So there is, all of this is to say, the role of English speakers, uh, um, the role of the Northumbrian kingdom, uh, and certainly the role of uh, Anglo-Saxon art styles within the mix of the Viking Age is something that is kind of underplayed. It kind of, uh, the oxygen gets sucked out of the room by the formation of the Dane law. And we don't, we tend to forget that there is a part of the world that is still its own kind of distinct kingdom. 
um, and Cumbria, the British speaking realm, is also in sharing space with that kingdom. So I think these two stories about this wider part of the world that Galloway and Dumfriesner find themselves in is something that can only be illuminated uh, by the Galloway horde, but not if we continue just calling it the product of just Vikings. There's a lot of people involved here. Another thing that I like about the Horde is how much of it is economic in the sense of there is chopped up silver, there's even a coin. You know, there are things that are money in a way, but they're deposited in a way that is not limited to just showing how much money you have. There is an art to showing your wealth in the Viking Age. And that's something that's shared from people of Scandinavian and insular uh, descent, okay? Um, this is a part of the economy in the North that is not yet coin using, even though coins are circulating. Uh, coins are sort of, uh, 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 are still kind of being used by their weight in silver uh, or other metals rather than by their face value at this point. And so a lot of showing uh, your wealth is about how you wear these things. And that's why the, uh, the silver that is coming into this area isn't uh, uh, sort of beaten into coins, it's beaten into these dress items which can then be chopped up. But there's also other more subtle ways of sort of showing and testing uh, weight. There are nicks and scratches that can be cut into the silver to test its quality. But there's also this pendant that I've shown you already before. This is that pendant after conservation. It seems to be encasing in very rich gold filigree, a black stone. And the purpose of encasing that is because this black stone, uh, this very smooth kind of black stone is very good at showing the streaks of gold and silver if you scratch precious metal on it. It's called a touchstone. It's a way of sort of testing the quality of the metal. But it is also more than just a utilitarian object. It is very elaborate and it's decorated in the same way as things that we think of as relics um, in this same hoard. And so there is a sense that there is a ceremonial role to testing silver. It's not just carried out by uh, a guy behind a desk, you know, like in a pawn shop. It is something that is done publicly. And Martin uh, and Mary have shown that there's actually little loops that allow the black stone to be taken out of this gold pendant fitting so that the black stone can be taken out and presumably some silver or some gold tested upon its surface and then it be replaced into its ceremonial holster in a way. So there's something very public and ceremonial and ritualized about sort of exchanging silver. It's not just a transaction. It means more. It sort of reflects on the character of the person giving the gift or giving the uh, the tribute payment, whatever this is, or sharing out the loot, if you're talking about Vikings, okay? And there's all these different elements of the horde which relate to that sort of ritual of payment and weighing. And this makes us look at other hordes of around this time in a new light. So there are hordes which seem to be random collections of things. The Talnatru horde, uh, um, from uh, from Kirkubrishir, not far from the fine spot of the Galloway Horde, uh, was found quite a long time ago in the 19th century and just seems like a mix of odds and ends. Uh, um, there's coins um, and there's dress items, but it just seemed like a random collection of stuff. And so it was called a metal workers hoard. But in amongst this hoard, there's the first of the Arabic coins, which ends up coming to Scotland and fueling that silver boom. This is uh, this hoard is a harbinger of what's to come. It's the first sort of uh, uh, the first of its kind, this sort of Viking Age hoard, which doesn't just include objects used by Vikings, but also very much Northumbrian material culture, more Trujillo style objects. But also, as you can see in the center, ways of displaying and showing your wealth. One of the coins is pierced and mounted as if it was made into a brooch. So these coins were not just being used, they were being displayed, they were being shown off because this was part of the work of the merchant, presumably, or of the warlord, showing that they have access to the good quality silver and gold. And this was one of the ways in which they did it. Also, this weight that you see in the center is uh, uh, a very heavy 
weights, not like the kind of weights that you find by the dozen in Viking encampments. This one is heavier and it's got a, a lovely bit of insular metalwork that's been cut just so to fit on this uh, uh, on this weight. Okay, so there is an element of display to that kind of weight, and I think it's possible that there is another very elaborate weight. So one of the pendants in the Galloway hoard might be a weight. It has a coin fitted into it, um, and it might just be a very elaborate kind of uh, uh, pendant weight, although there's very few uh, pendant weights of this time. They're usually uh, the kind of weights that go on a scale pan, but it's one of the possible uh, uh, uses of this composite object. Moving away from the economy, though, there is much more that we can say about the people behind this, and I'm really excited about the potential that future research might show just how gendered some hordes are. You know, we the names that are inscribed on those silver arm rings from the Galloway Horde, only one of them is a full name, and that's Eckbert, a male name, a common uh, Old English name, and the other ones are just elements. And there are elements of male names, but they can be found in female names as well. The fact is that we don't know if it's men or women or both who are behind those four inscriptions. We know there are some men, and it's the men whose names get recorded in the annals. They're the kings, the bishops, Higwald, of course, uh, the moneyers, the people who strike the coins, and the kings whose names are on the coins. It's the men whose names get recorded, but many of the objects in this hoard in particular uh, could also be uh, women's objects, almost certainly in some cases. Uh, a lot of the heirlooms, the beads, this rock crystal ball that has been made into a mount of some sort, these are the kinds of things that you find in Anglo-Saxon burials, but specifically the burials of women in the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries. And that's probably how old some of these items are. It seems like they've been knocking around and instead of finding their way into a grave of a woman in the 6th or the 7th century, they've been kept in the family and they've been remounted. So this silver mount that you can see on that rock crystal ball uh, is certainly uh, uh, more, it's younger than the rock crystal object itself. It shows that wear to it. So that, uh, uh, that silver object has probably been remounted at some point. So this is something that has not only been kept in the family, it's been sort of reused in a way. And unlike other rock crystal balls that you find in Anglo-Saxon graves, this one isn't a pendant. It had to be held in the hand. There's no suspension loop for this. It's a really weird object. And, uh, but the fact is, it's, uh, it's also very ancient, potentially. And um, there are pairs of silver brooches, one on each shoulder. And we don't know if those were for men and women. Uh, but there is one brooch that has no pair. And that pres presumably has been worn uh, on the center, on the chest. And that is uh, the position that we know women wore some brooches, but also clergy bishops uh, and, thing, uh, and, and people of ecclesiastical high status. They also wore central brooches. And so it's not clear whether this is necessarily a woman's object. And some of these uh, things like what we think are probably wrist clasps on the uh, upper right hand side are probably uh, fem uh, uh, female gendered items, but they're unique, frankly. And so we don't actually know. But it's possible that there are many female gendered items in this object. And that means that possibly some of the donors some of the owners uh, of these things uh, are, are men and women, uh, uh, certainly uh, then when it was gathered together, but also in the past when these objects were first used. There are other hordes that have come up in recent years, uh, which are, are, are not nearly sort of as elaborate or um, as heavy in terms of silver and gold as the Galloway horde, but they are beginning to form a little layer of late 9th to early 10th century hordes. Uh, uh, and they seem to cluster so far in the northern part of the Irish Sea. Uh, Cheshire, there's one from Anglesey, uh, uh, or, or North, sorry, Flintshire from Northern Wales, which is kind of different from the rest. And it's possible that we're sort of building up a picture of hoarding in this area, which involves Anglo-Saxon Trujillo style objects that the Galloway Horde can then be fitted into. So that's an area for future research, certainly. There's this weird period of the sort of 
870s to the 890s to 900, where there are objects which there are hordes which don't look like Viking hordes as they would come to take shape, but they are sort of on the progress of becoming that. And the Galloway Horde can most fruitfully be put in that context. There's a lot of sacred material potentially in here. The rock crystal vessel, as I mentioned, has an inscription on the base that mentions a bishop. Incontrovertibly, that has come out of probably a church treasury and a very wealthy church, okay? And there's very few bishops of Northumbria if this is a Northumbrian object, as we believe. It can only have come from four, uh, four or five different places. And the nearest one to this is in Whithorn. Certainly, Whithorn has its share of gold and other objects uh, uh, from around this time. So it's a candidate uh, for something, again, that has been sourced locally, even though the rock crystal itself is an ancient and exotic object. We know that's come from the church. The pectoral cross certainly has been taken off of a high-ranking ecclesiastic, uh, whether it's an abbot or an abbess or a bishop. And of course, there's the clay, the, the dirt balls, which appear to be uh, possibly relics of saints. But it doesn't mean that this was uh, the objects of a raid on a single church treasury. Again, a lot of the objects are dress items, secular objects. And so there are different elements of this hoard, only some of which seem to have come from the church. But I think it's possible that some of these are either directly from a church treasury, or they could be badges of office. They've been taken off or donated by a bishop or an abbot or an abbess as one of the donors. They could equally be, as rare as these things are, they could just be personal possessions in a way. They could be, some of these things, elements of private devotion. And that brings us to the charms and the curios uh, uh, that uh, form that upper element of the vessel. Some of these things have been kept not for their value in rare objects or precious metal, but because they're weird and distinct. Uh, things like the rattlestone is a natural, uh, naturally hollowed out uh, uh, geode-like object that has a little bit of a little nodule in it that rattles around. Again, it has no inherent value. Uh, the fact that it was placed along with this necklace potentially of, of beads and other pendants means that there was something significant about it. Could these be things that were just heirlooms, just valued because they were old, or did they have some kind of power? And we know that beads and fossils can take on elements, natural objects can take on supernatural power in the life of St. Columba. Columba blesses a white pebble. And so there are white quartz pebbles that end up in graves that have been interpreted as sort of natural objects that are imbued with supernatural meaning. Is that what we're looking at here? Is all of this uh, potentially sacred offering uh, of some sort? Is it an offering to the church? We know it was deposited on what is now, what becomes church land, but was it a church then? Only more excavation could really sort that out, but it's an evocative possibility. But is it just for safekeeping? Is it just a stash of money? Is it a sacrifice? Is it coming back to this binding contract of four arm rings and four parcels of silver, things carefully stacked into this? Is this an offering? in before the eyes of God? Is it a vow, an oath taken by these people to come together for whatever reason? Is it possibly a curse? Is the writing of names like Egbert not saying uh, uh, that these are the owners of this silver, but something uh, similar to a sort of votive curse tablet in Roman times? You know, all of these are possibilities. Uh, and the fact is, we have this pectoral cross, certainly a Christian object, but it's also had its central mount taken off. Has that been a uh, uh, a form of desecration of this object, or does it still retain some of that sacred protective value? Is that cross protecting the contents of the hoard underneath, or is it just more silver? All of these things are possible, and they're being uh, researched now. There's a lot more to be done on the runes. There is one runic inscription which is still undeciphered. We have other undecipherable runic inscriptions like this uh, uh, finger ring from Cramond, uh, for instance, which dates around this time. So again, there might be sort of cryptic elements to this. There might be magical elements to this as much as just sort of uh, the names of potential owners. All of these things are possible. But the last thing I want to do is just kind of take us away
away, I suppose, from that world of just warlords and uh, 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 the slave trade, which is fueling this Viking Age, and bring it back to the fact that at least some of this we know are ancient objects, heirlooms, things that have been curated over time. And some element of this hoard is a family history a family story or maybe multiple families stories that have come together. And that's just a world away from how we think about Viking Age hordes usually. And it's something that the Viking Age horde, of the, the Galloway horde is allowing us to think about uh, almost for the first time. Uh, okay. Um, and I think I'll just leave it on that thought. Okay. Let me put some acknowledgments up. Thank you very much.